that, but it, I mean, I still got 25 minutes. Well, I got a quick question. Oh, okay, good. We still don't have. We don't know what Sarai's input to this was. No, we don't. Launch. She would have in that decision. No. One way or the other. We don't. But we do know in first uh, from uh, Peter that it said that um, women are to. I'm paraphrasing, emulate her because she even called her husband Lord. She treated him, she would do, she obeyed her husband and called him Lord. And, and that's, you know, the marriage vows, nobody When did that in. stop? Huh? <laughs> yeah. The obey part? Yeah, I gotta tell you about that obey part. <laughs> when did that go away with that? Well, I'll tell you, um, I was doing my parents' 50th wedding anniversary, uh, doing their, redoing their vows. And just before I did them, I went over to my mom and said, Hey, Mom, for $50, I'll switch the vows and they'll have to obey you. <laughs> did she give you 50? No, she, she, but she found it very funny. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where that, that part in the vows, that goes back to uh, that Sarah obeyed her husband and even called him Lord. Okay. And so she, she uh, is like the model, model wife there. It never tells anyone that they have to, any wife that she has to obey her husband. But she voluntarily did so. Now it does say we submit to one another. And it says uh, wives are to submit to their husbands. Uh, and it says men are to love their wives. And neither one is supposed to tell the other, you've got to submit or you've got to love. But if you've ever, if you want to read a really excellent book on that whole idea, it's called Love and Respect by Emerson Egriches. It's an excellent, excellent book. I read the book while I was on jur jury duty and um, waiting. And I started it. And when I went home, I couldn't put the book down. I read through the whole book in a day. And then I said to my wife, I said, I really like this. I said, this guy does conferences all over the country. I said, um, why don't we just take a weekend and go to one of these? I said, if it's a California, just get a flight, go out there, we'll go to his conference. I said, you good, get away. So I look up online, he's in Troy. <laughs> so we went over to Troy. And, and we saw him live like two weeks later. And in fact, he's going to be back here uh, sometime in a couple weeks. He's at the Faith Lutheran Church in Troy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. What's his last name? Egg Riches. Egg Riches. E G G R I C H E S. E -G -G -R -I -C -H -E -S something like that. Egg Riches. Emerson Egg Riches. Love and Respect. Uh, ex excellent book. All right. Before you all get away, I can move on to another topic here. It's really a good one too. I thought there might uh, we might need these. Anybody who wants to stick around? I want to tie the whole thing together. And I got it with a chart. I'm not sure. No, I don't How do you spell Everton? E G G R I C H E S, something like that. That's close. If you type it in on Google, they'll correct it. They'll correct your spelling. I love Google. Because you, you only gotta be close for Google. Alright. So in case we don't get done, I've written up the whole thing on the side column there. Alright? So uh, this uh I am a dispensationalist, so it's a dispensationalism has to do with hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the art and science of interpreting the Bible. And I am a dispensationalist because I take a literal progressive revelation approach to the Bible. That uh, it has a historical, grammatical interpretation that belongs to it. It actually took place in time. It's written in a language that is grammatical. And uh, God didn't give us everything all at once. So, as a dispensationalist, a dispensation is a distinguishable economy in the program of God in which mankind has a particular responsibility. <laughs> the key word is economy. Economy. We are capitalists in America. That's a certain kind of economy. Socialists have a different kind of economy. All right? Fascists have another kind of economy. There are different kinds of economies. They all function in doing certain things in a governmental and in a marketplace way, all right? 
there are distinguishable economies in the Bible. I, but I want you to think of them as stewardships. And here's what I mean by that. Dispensationalists ad advocate that God is the master. God is the most high. He's sovereign. He's over all. And He gives responsibilities to us, the creatures, and He assigns meaning to the creation. It's kind of like God, if I were to use the word employed, He's the employer. Okay? Who gives the responsibilities and assigns the meaning to the task. And he's, he, God is the, the highest. So I call Him, in the dispensational sense, He's the dispenser. He gives the responsibility of what to do. Now, mankind is the steward. He's the master. I'm the steward. I'm the slave. I'm the one that he gives responsibility to. Mankind receives responsibilities that are given by God. Just like an employer gives the employee. The employee is the person who he's employed to do something. Or if I dispense something. I give it to someone who is the dispensee. They get it. They receive it. Now, the dispensation is the thing that you're responsible, the responsibility given by the master to the steward. It is the stewardship. Taking the employer thing. The employer has an employee, and what he does is the employment. That's his job. That's his responsibility. That's his stewardship. When I was a paper boy, I had a boss. Okay? I was the paper boy. My job, my responsibility, was to deliver papers, collect money, bring it back in. Okay? And, and so... God is the master. Mankind is the one that is held accountable to God to do something. What they do, well, that, that part, that, that's the em employment part, that's the dispensation. And so that's what we call the dispensation. I, I'm just trying to get as concrete terms as I can that a dispensation is the thing for which you are responsible as part of mankind to God. Does that make sense? Now, because God has given His revelation progressively, we didn't get the whole thing all at once. God gave the first five books of the Bible to Moses. A little later, we get the book of Joshua. Judge, we, we didn't get the revelation first thing. All right? It's a progressively. It's not a single installment. There are <clears throat> distinguishable economies or dispensations, responsibilities spelled out in the Bible for mankind in which he has given these different responsibilities. Now, because he's done that, it's most easy for me to show you overview with a chart. And that's what I have, is uh, that little chart that's on the page. Now, everything I'm telling you is in the columns right next to it. But uh, I want you to think, eternity past. God existed forever and ever and ever, all eternity in the past. Eternity future, God exists forever and ever and ever. In fact, with God... Um, it's all continuously one. He is still in eternity past as he is in eternity future because there is no time element to God. He always is, always was, always will be. He exists totally different than we do. Um, somewhere he's created time. I got this black spot here. In time. Now, in time, he created, we've been studying that. Genesis chapter 1, the whole creation. He creates a planet that's not suitable for man. Man is the focal point. Once he creates man, he creates man in his own image. And when he did that, he made man responsible to take care of the garden. He made him responsible uh, to till the ground. He made him responsible. He equipped him with a positive holiness, righteousness, and true knowledge. Dispensationalists call this Genesis chapter 1 to 3, the dispensation of innocence. It's not innocence. It's positive holiness, but that's a mouthful. So we call it innocence. It's more than just being innocent. Innocent is neutral. But when God created man, he had a positive holiness. And uh, he was made in the image of God. He saw the whole creation correctly. He was holy as God was holy. He was righteous. He did everything right until the tempter came along and the whole thing fell. Innocence, this whole period of time here of this dispensation of innocence. You see, Adam was to live for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Adam was to live for the glory of God in holding his true righteousness, knowledge, and holiness. All of them, and he's to live for the glory of God. Tempter comes along, they fall. Innocence is ended. He lost true righteousness, holiness, 
and we have a relative degree of that. You know, I still uh, can do some right things. I, I still do have knowledge. It's just not complete true knowledge. That ended with the fall. After that, we saw another dispensation. God said, the day you eat uh, of that, uh, that tree, you'll surely die. But there was a tree there. It was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat of that fruit, you would know good and evil. That's where the beginning of conscience takes place. Man now knows good and evil. He has a conscious part of him that passes judgment onto what he does, whether it's good or evil. And so innocence is a time period before the fall, ends with the fall. Conscience kicks right in at that point. So now he is to live for the glory of God, knowing good and evil. He's to choose the good and shun the evil. And so man is accountable to God to live for his glory through a conscience. No, we still have conscience today. Conscience doesn't end. But people living by their conscience, Cain slew his brother Abel and said, Am I my brother's keeper? Because my conscience, according to Romans chapter 2, I either accuse myself of doing wrong or I excuse myself for having done something wrong. And so Cain is excusing himself. I'm not my brother's keeper. And so conscience, conscience ends with everybody, the imaginations of their heart was only evil all the time, continuously. And so God brings about a flood. We have innocence, ends with the fall. Conscience still goes on today, but he wipes out everybody. And after the flood, because I still have a conscience today, he establishes human government. There's a time period in the scripture from the end of the flood, it's going to be superseded, that God made a command. He said, Whoso sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. He gives man the highest form of government, the right to take another man's life of for cap, in capital punishment for a capital crime. And so it establishes government so that man will govern man all for the glory of God. All for the glory of God. Well, we find that this, 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 this responsibility still goes on today. In Romans chapter 13, we are still accountable to our government. The government is still to bear the sword for what is good. Okay, We as citizens of the democracy... We still have a responsibility as citizens. One of our responsibilities is to vote, but there's more than that. I'm supposed to be a law-abiding citizen and all that, okay? And so government continues today, but it's superseded by what the thing that ends, comes to the end or in between the two, and that is the call. The call of Abraham that we've just looked at, I've just summarized everything we've looked at so far in Genesis. This is Genesis 1 through 11, chapter 12, Abraham is called. Out of all the mankind, here God is dealing with all mankind. We call them Gentiles. All the Gentiles, innocence, conscience, and government, they are the ones, everybody is responsible. At the time of Abraham, he is not the only person that is righteous. There is a guy by the name of Melchizedek. Remember him, Melchizedek? He was the king of Salem, later called Jerusalem. <coughs> Abraham pays him tithes because he's a priest of the Most High God. All right? And so, there's, there's no Jews, there's no Hebrews, there's no Israel. It's all mankind. It's all Adam, all man. Innocence, conscience, government. But now God calls out of this group one man, Abram, and he makes a promise to him, and we have the next dispensation promise. We just looked at that in Genesis chapter 12, like the first five verses. He makes a promise, I'm going to give you a land, I'm going to give you a seed, and I'm going to, uh, through you, I'm going to bless the entire, the, all, all the nations of the earth, all the people on the earth. And the, the promise still exists today. The promises God made to Abraham are still in effect. But they are superseded by the giving of the law. In the promise, he's going to make them a nation. They're first a group of a tribe, you know, 12 tribes. They go to Mount Sinai, and we went through the book of Exodus on Sunday mornings. And at Mount Sinai, they get the law. And the law constitutes them now as no longer just the promise that they will be a nation of Israel, but they actually have the law, and God is their king. He dwells in their midst. The, the Ark of the Covenant, in one place, it's called the throne of God. God sits on his throne in the midst of his people so that we have 
the, the law of God in the nation Israel. Now the law continues from giving it on Mount Sinai all the way to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus died on the cross, <coughs> he ended the law. I'm no longer under the law. I, I don't have to, you know, there's 613 commands and prohibitions in the Torah. Jesus fulfilled the law for me. My law is this, if I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, love my neighbor as myself, that I will fulfill everything that was in the law because that is the law of Christ. So I don't live any longer under all those laws. I love the Lord and I love my neighbor as myself. And so he's done away from that. that. So innocence and law are done. Conscience, government, promise still go on because there's promises yet to be fulfilled to Abraham. The next one, if we were just reading from the Old Testament, skip the New Testament. You're a Jewish person. You don't have the Old Testament. You just have, I mean, you don't have the New Testament. You just have the Old Testament. The next thing on, on God's calendar, Isaiah 53 predicted Jesus would be crucified, he would die, and he would resurrect from the dead. It also tells us in Daniel chapter 9 that there will be a tribulation period. Jesus is the one who called it tribulation. There it's called the 70th week of Daniel, the 70th seven of Daniel. It's a period of time of great tribulation on the earth. In the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 19, cover this period, okay, of God's wrath upon the earth. And that was coming, so theoretically, if when Jesus came into Jerusalem, they said, Hail Jesus, you're our king, king of the Jews, and the whole nation had accepted him. Theoretically, had they done that, the Romans would have crucified him for an insurrection and treason, and he would have been buried and resurrected from the dead. There would have immediately begun this period of seven years of wrath poured out by God, at the end of which Jesus would come back from heaven after the tribulation period, and then he would establish his kingdom on the earth. I believe a coming kingdom is going to actually take place here on planet earth. Jesus is going to return to the earth. He's going to be King Jesus. He's going to sit upon his throne in Jerusalem as a king and a priest on his throne. And that's going to last for a thousand years. I know that because it says so six times in the book of Revelation chapter 20, the first few verses. It says six times. It's a thousand years long. And then at the end of that thousand years, there's going to be a final great white throne judgment upon which Jesus will sit and he will judge the living and the dead. And after that, we enter into this heaven and earth is dissolved, as we saw from Peter. And a new heaven and a new earth, we enter into eternity future. And people say, well, where in the world's a church? All right, there's a church. The church is an intercalary period of time inserted in the program. You know what an interclary day is? February 29th. We had one this year. What do we do? Every four years we insert this day to adjust the calendar. It's an intercalation. This intercalation, the church, the whole church age, Israel rejected their king. So, lo, I turn to the Gentiles, is what they say in the book of Acts. And the gospel goes to Gentiles. The Gentiles receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and King. And so we are now in the, in the church age. This is what happens, okay? Sandwiched on this little line here in between this whole chart is the church age. Jesus went into heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit. The church was born on the day of Pentecost. The church is going to be raptured at the end of the tribulation. I mean, at, at the end of the church age, it's going to go into heaven. And while the tribulation is going on on earth, we're going to be in heaven. And then after the tribulation, we're going to return with Jesus. Now, if I could just expand this a little bit. All right, watch. I'm going to expand it. Oh, there we go. There's the church age. It's God's intercalation in there. Because the Jews reject it, the gospel has gone to the Gentiles. I'm in this church. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And so what we have... God dealing with all mankind, he calls one man out. Now the church age, according to 1 Corinthians, is made up of both Jews and Gentiles in one new man. This is a whole new entity. So from the day of Pentecost, that's when the church began, Acts chapter 2. There was no church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church. It's future tense. It didn't exist all this time. It wasn't seen by any of the prophets. Paul calls the church a mystery. A mystery is something that was hidden but now is revealed. Paul's saying it's only revealed in the New Testament since Jesus told us he will build it. The church begins on the day of Pentecost 
and it's, gonna, it's been going on now for about 2,000 years. And when the last person gets saved in the church age, we'll be raptured out of here. God's going to resume his dealing again with the Jews in the tribulation period and with the Gentiles, both, both of them here, not the church. We're in heaven. We appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We receive our rewards for what we have done. When Jesus returns at the end to set up his kingdom, because the Bible says wherever Jesus goes, we go. We come back with him. I'm going to be in the millennial kingdom. I've never been to Holy Land, but I know I'm going then. <laughs> I can save my money. I don't have to go now. I'm going then. All right. Wherever he goes, I go. I'm going to be with him forever. All right. And so I'll be in the kingdom. There's so much, so much here. This is just a snapshot, overview of the whole thing. I mean, from the second half of e e e Ezekiel talks about what it's like in the kingdom. Uh, the second part of Isaiah talks about kingdom life. I mean, there's so much uh, th that the Bible has recorded. Um, most of the prophets predict this kingdom period. And then at the end of the kingdom, it's right by throne judgment, and where we go to be in eternity, the new heaven, new earth, with God forever, or you are sentenced to a place that was pre originally prepared for the devil and his angels that we call hell, Gehenna, goes by different terms, forever and ever. <laughs> if you want a, a side parallel column, column there, I wrote it all up. Yeah, I see. That. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's uh, this is like this is all foundation. You, you get the if you can see the hole, you can then plug in all the little pieces where they go, where they go, where they go. Because I believe God, God has a plan for all of time, from beginning to end. He's got his plan. Thank you for uh, hanging in there with me. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll wrap up with prayer. I have ended on time. Father in heaven, it, it's so reassuring in our hearts that not only have you begun all things and told us about it, but you've told us how it's all going to end. And we are on the winning team. We should be encouraged. <clears throat> it's like we've already read the end of the book. We know what's going to happen before it happens. We're thankful, Lord, out of all the world, your spirit has opened our eyes. Remove the blinders so that we would see the glorious gospel and that we would believe in Jesus as our Savior. Lord, help us to share our faith so that others would uh, come to know Jesus whom to know we know is life eternal. Lord, we pray that you would build your church right here. Build us up so that we have confidence to share with others and that they too can be a part of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. I do want your evaluation. So. And if you have any more questions, ask Roger.